Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Hebrews chapter 9, we're going to skip over uh, a few verses that have primarily to do with the furniture that was located in the tabernacle and in the temple that was uh, primarily indicative of the foreshadowing of the Lord Jesus Christ. I looked all of that over, studied it over carefully, and uh, just really felt like that we could be um, uh, looking a little more closely at the passage we are today. And you may find the wording that I'm going to be using a little bit differently, and I do that for uh, really simplicity's sake and for understanding and clarity uh, <clears throat> that ordinarily we would not uh, be uh, receiving. So uh, bear with us this morning just a little bit as we look at this passage beginning in verse number 12. I do want to read the last verse first. It's in verse 28, if you will. So the Bible says, So also after Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, to those who eagerly await him, he will appear the second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation. We have uh, <clears throat> we've been studying Hebrews uh, for a number of weeks, and we have come to the conclusion that Jesus is a better sacrifice. Jesus is a better covenant. Jesus is a better high priest. And after today, we're going to be seeing that Jesus also uh, is a better blood sacrifice than what we were looking at um, in the last few weeks in the Old Covenant. Uh, if I were to ask you the question this morning, what do you think was the greatest event in human history? What was the most pivotal event that was to ever occur in human history, what would you say? I personally believe that it's the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It changed everything. The passage today really delves into the death of Christ. And there's some facets about his death uh, that I want to expose to us all this morning. The first thing that I want you to see with me is this. It is a purifying death. Say the word purifying. It's a purifying death. In verse number 13, chapter 9, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a young cow sprinkled on those who are defiled, consecrated them and provided ritual purity, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our consciences, from dead works to worship the living God. Now I want you to notice the contrast that is so obvious and evident in these couple of verses. He starts out by saying these animal sacrifices cleansed only the outward. And Jesus comes and the contrast to that is that Jesus cleanses us to the very core of our being. The Bible says here all the way down to the very crevice of the consciousness that we have. He cleanses us completely inside, purifies us totally uh, to the very depth of our conscience. Now, the fact of the matter is, we only have a partial, while we're here in this body, we only have a partial understanding of what cleansing is. I'll give you maybe a crude example of that. Some of you spent uh, quite a while yesterday washing your car. You got it out, pulled it in your driveway, or you went down to the car wash, one of the two, and you, uh, you, you, you washed off the mud, and you washed off the grime, and the grease, and the dirt, and, and, and then you cleaned the windows real good, and then when you finished up that, you went down to the tires, and you washed the tires, and the wheels, and the rims, and, and, and then maybe if you really did something right, you, you blackened the tires a little bit, got them shinied up. Well, then guess what happened? On your way to church this morning, there was a little showers that occurred maybe before you started out. And if you were like me, I was coming through one of those new construction sites. They're building those houses and the rain had got a little bit of uh, mud there on the road and my car looks like a mess today. So we just have a little partial uh, understanding of what it means 
just to touch the surface of something in the cleansing. Now Jesus comes along and purifies us, purifies man, cleanses man in a way that man had never, ever been cleansed before. First John in his little epistle there in that first chapter in the seventh verse, he says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. One of the more popular verses in the New Testament is Titus 2.14. And he says he gave himself for us to free us from uh, the, the lawlessness and to purify for himself a people who are truly his, who are eager to do good. You know, God wants a pure people. And a matter of fact, if you study the book of Ephesians, you'll discover that he is coming back for a cleansed people. He's coming back for a purified people. You understand that that's exactly what sets us apart as God's people from the world out there. It sets us apart from the world's people, this cleansing. We're not talking about an outwardly cleansing or a washing, but we're talking about the very depths of who we are down to the very core of our existence God purifies us in every crevice. Now notice what he says in the latter part of that. And he says, who are eager to do good. Now the problem with a lot of folks is, is they say, you know, I've been washed by the blood of Jesus. I've been cleansed. I've been purified. And then we come on a Sunday morning and we just find that, you know, it's adequate just to be able to sit and to hear and to listen and to absorb and to take it all in, burp a little bit and go home and we think we've done God a favor. But the Bible says that he's purified people who are eager to do good, who are eager to serve. I think it would be wonderful, don't you, that for every person who's been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, that when we put it on our tombstone, we put out there, she served, he served. I, I think that would be a marvelous epitaph for any of us who claim to know the Lord Jesus Christ. So it is a purifying death. Now the second thing I want you to notice about this death is this. It is a profitable death. Watch again now in verse 15. And so he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the eternal inheritance he has promised since he died to set them free from the sin committed under the first covenant or the violations that committed under the old covenant. Now, I don't know how many of you are here are genuinely saved by the grace of God or not, but if you're saved today, let me just tell you, you had very little to do with it. Uh, you understand, you are saved because God called you to salvation. I'll never forget as long as I live on the back row of that Baptist church in Colleen, Texas, and I was called by God. Now, I had to respond to that calling, but God called me. And the only reason that I'm saved today is because God called me to himself. And the Bible says here that he set free from the sins under the first covenant. Have you ever wondered, and I, I guess probably one of the most asked questions uh, that I've had in, in the 40 plus years of, of ministry is people ask, well, Pastor, how were people saved in the Old Testament? How were they saved under the Old Covenant? How were they saved when they did not have the Holy Spirit, when they did not have the death of Christ, when they did not have the resurrection of Jesus? We have all of that, but they didn't. And so how were they saved? Were they saved under the law? Absolutely not. The only thing that the law could do was to expose their sin. The law couldn't do anything about their sin. It just showed them that they were sinners. So you say, well then, if they weren't saved under the law, how then were they saved? Well, now watch this. You and I look back to the finished work of Jesus. We look back at his death. We look back at his burial. We look back at his resurrection. We look back at his ascension and we place our faith in what he has done. People under the old covenant, they heard the message of the prophets. They listened to the word of God as it was preached. 
and the prophecy of his coming. And so they weren't saved under the law. They looked by faith to the cross with anticipation of what Jesus was going to do. We look back at what he did. They looked forward to what he was going to do and they placed their faith in that. So Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection was retroactive to those that were looking with anticipation to the cross. So they were saved under the old covenant. Now, watch this in verse 16. For where there is a will, there is relatives. No, that's not what it said, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> for where there is a will, the death of the one who made it must be proven. In other words, um, the only effective way that a will is, is that the person who made the will had to die. Y'all tracking with me? Shake your head like that. That's the only way a will is effective. All right, I mean, well, for a will takes effect only at death, since it carries no force while the one who made it is alive. Now, last year, Kathy and I spent weeks and weeks formulating our will. Uh, we had an outside person come uh, and help us, a dear friend who's an attorney, uh, who helped us uh, write out our will. Spent a lot of time making sure that the will projected our wishes. A and we made sure that, matter of fact, uh, we put First Baptist Church Indian Trail as one of the major beneficiaries of our will. Uh, it it's a significant amount of money. And the reason that we did that uh, is because God had shown us that not only are we to be stewards of what he has entrusted to us now, we're to be stewards of what he has entrusted to us after we are gone. And so I wanted to make sure that at least a tithe went in uh, to our will for the explicit purpose of the ministry of First Baptist in which we love with all of our heart. And I believe, listen, I, I believe that that's what all of us ought to do. And, and, and your church ought, ought to be a significant part uh, of what you intend to leave behind. Now, my kids have never seen our will. They've never read. We've talked to them about it, and they've shown absolutely no interest in reading it or knowing what it says. Matter of fact, unless Kathy has told them, they don't even know where it is. And so if we were to die, now here's what's going to happen. They may not have an interest in it right now, but the minute that our heart quits beating, They'll make a beeline and wear out the carpet getting over there to where that will is going to be so that they, are y'all tracking with me here? So, so the will is not much of anything until the death. When you die, it gets real interesting. Now, now so, so, so what is he saying here? Now, this is applying to, to Christ. Look at verse 18. So even the first covenant was inaugurated with blood. For when Moses had spoken every command to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself or the law itself and all the people. Now, this is amazing, folks. Even before the tabernacle, Moses put the law into effect by a will and the will became effective by the death of the animal but it took a death. Now, look at verse 21. And both the tabernacle and all the utensils of worship, he likewise sprinkled with blood. Indeed, according to the law, almost everything was purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Now, notice the little term, almost everything. Now, this is an eye-opener for a lot of people. Because Leviticus chapter 5 made a provision. If you were extremely poor and you could not afford an animal sacrifice, provisions were made that you could bring an ephod of flour and offer that up in the place of the blood sacrifice. But that was the only provision that was made. He comes right after that and says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. There is no remission of sins. If I could hammer something this morning down deep into our hearts that we would not forget it because the fact of the matter is we don't live like it. Fact of the matter is we live just the opposite of it. Hear me a minute. This is it. Forgiveness 
is not cheap. We live like it is. We act like it is. But forgiveness is not cheap. We have somehow the idea that God looks down on us from glory and he has the perspective of saying, you know what, I'm, gonna lie. I'm just gonna let up a little bit. They're, they're just human beings. And so I'm gonna overlook their sin. I, I know they probably didn't mean to do that. I know it probably carried them a lot further than what they wanted to go. And, and, and so I, I'm just at this time, I'm going to overlook what they have done in their life. Let, let me say to you this morning, God does not overlook sin. He does not turn a blind eye to sin. The old covenant, sin cost a man his very lamb without spot and without blemish. In the new covenant, it cost God his very son. It cost Jesus his life. Sin is costly. Forgiveness is not cheap. Now, there's a big trend going on, and I've been watching it my 40 plus years of ministry in Protestantism, like I, I doubt very seriously has ever been seen in the history of Christianity. I, I've watched it for these 40 plus years. You have these extremes. Uh, you have the, the, the left extreme, and you have the right extreme. Now, Protestant, matter of fact, I was witnessing to this young lady the other day, and she says, I am a Protestant. Well, that, that encompasses a broad spectrum in our culture today. And, and it is extremes. One of the extremes I read two days ago uh, from the Daily Wire in Great Britain, where a doctor was fired from his position in the medical field because he would not call a biological man a woman. He wouldn't do it. She had had, uh, she was transgendered. And he wouldn't call her a woman because he was born biologically a man and got fired for it. And he then took it to court to try and get his job back. The court ruled against him and made this statement that the Bible is incompatible with human dignity and the rights of man in his dignity supersedes the teachings of the Bible. And he failed to get his job back. Now, that is the left extreme. By the way, don't you think that that stuff's not coming to this country because it's well on its way, it's here. Now, now the other extreme, if you were to talk, would be... Uh, Fundamentalism. Do you, do you know what a fundamentalist is? A fundamentalist is a person who believes what the Bible says and the Bible means what it says. Now your pastor is a fundamentalist. I believe in the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in the fundamental truths of our faith. I believe Jesus was born of a virgin. I believe he lived a sinless life. I believe he died a vicarious death on the cross to pay your sin debt and to pay my sin debt. I believe that he was buried in a borrowed tomb. I believe he rose on the third day. I believe that he's coming back one of these days to gather us unto himself. I am a fundamentalist. That is the definition of a fundamentalist. Now that trend, part of it, started a few years ago when people started taking the blood out of the hymnals of the worship services, removed even the very mention of it in their hymns because it was hugely offensive to the well-educated. Well, the last time that I read the Bible, the cross is offensive. It's offensive to those who want to be saved in their own self-righteousness. It is offensive to those who want to pull up themselves by their own bootstraps. It is offensive to those who want to be saved by their own arrogant pride, 
By the way, ladies and gentlemen, Southern Baptists, don't you think that we're immune to all of this because I'm watching it right now seeping into our denomination. When our denomination, some of our denominational leaders are saying, hey guys, you don't need to be so hard about this particular subject matter of the Bible because if you do, it reduces the gene pool of the people who will come to hear you preach. And then come right on the other heels of that and say, now here's another little subject matter over here that you don't need to delve into and don't address it and don't be so biblical about it because if you are, you will reduce the size of your gene pool that would keep you from being able to reach them with the gospel. So tone it down. Tone it down. Water it down just a little bit. Back off from it just a little bit. I'm telling you, friends, that's where we are in this country. That's where we are in our denomination. But the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Now, it's a profitable death. Third, it is a perpetual death. A perpetual death. Not that that death had to be repeated over and over again, but perpetual in the effect that the death never stops. Pick it up in verse 23. So it was necessary for the sketches of the things in heaven to be purified with these sacrifices. But the heavenly things themselves required better sacrifice than these. In other words, even in the Old Testament, these outward external things that are listed over in the first part of the chapter, uh, they had to be purified. Then he says the heavenly things had to be purified with a better sacrifice. Couldn't be the same as the outward. Had to be different. Had to be better because he was more interested in what was going on on the inside than he was what was going on on the outside. Now, one of the things that, that just thrills me about being saved is this. God sees us as if we were already living in the heavenlies. If you go to Ephesians chapter 2 and just study it out, you understand that when God looks at us, he looks at us through the blood of Christ. And we've been purified by a better sacrifice that fits us for eternity. And so when God looks at us, he looks at us not as if we are living down here on this earth, but he looks at us as if we are already wired up, geared up, ready, living in glory. Now, powerful word in a perpetual Death. Now look at verse 24. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with hands, the representation of the true sanctuary, but into heaven itself. And he appears now in God's presence for us. I want you to read that last phrase again. He appears now in God's presence for us. Here's a remarkable thing about chapter number nine. The writer of Hebrews gives us Three appearances of Christ. If you'll notice right here in verse number 24, he's talking about he is appearing right now for us, in the present for us. If you go to verse 26, he said that he appeared in the past for us. If you go down to verse 28, he's going to appear in the future for us. So there are three major appearances that are recorded here. Now notice verse 24 with me. What, what in the world does all of this mean? That why is he now appearing before God in God's presence? Why is he there appearing for us? If I were to ask you a question this morning, I go over to Reed. Hey, hey Reed. He's sitting right over here. Hey, Reed. Why is Jesus appearing in God's presence for you and me now? Here's what Reed would tell you. Because we need help. Hmm? I don't know about you, but I need help. Why do I, why do I need help here? Because you understand in verse 24, he's appearing before God for us 
because we not only needed his forgiveness for our past sins, he is pleading our case day and night until we go home to be with God. Now, this is about the fifth time that the writer of Hebrews has brought all this up. Why is he there interceding? Because the fact of the matter is, you and I are constantly getting beat up every day of our life because of the world and the flesh and the devil that is reminding us over and over again of what our life was like before we came to Christ. And may I say a word to you? I, I, don't, I don't really try to get too crazy about this stuff, but my life was a mess before I came to Jesus. You, you have no idea what your pastor's life was like before 20 years of age. I was a mess. I was a wreck. And there, there's things in my past, ladies and gentlemen, that are horrific to me. Would to God that I could somehow go back and erase some of that garbage out of my life so that I would not give the enemy any tool or weapon that he could use against me today and point at me, and he does. You'd think when, at my age now that I wouldn't be fooling with this kind of stuff, but I promise you it's an ongoing battle all your life. The old enemy's coming, old slew foot come. The Bible says that he is an accuser. And so he comes and accuses you of what you used to do. Who do you think you are to pastor a 7,000 member church? Who do you think that you are that you're going to get into heaven? Who do you... Can I just say to you again, <laughs> he, he, he's fighting a losing battle when he throws up and says, you piece of trash, you, you have no way, you have no reason to believe you're going to be a part of the kingdom of God. I just get to the point, I get tired of hearing it, and I say, you know what? <laughs> God's dealt with that in my past. I reject that in the name of Jesus. I'm under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I belong to him. And I remind him of where he's going to be one of these days. One of these days, devil, you know, God's forgiven me in my past, but I know what your future is going to be like. Now, verse 25. And he did not enter to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the sanctuary year after year with blood that is not his own. It, this brings me to the fifth point, the fourth point. It, it's a personal death. It's a personal death with blood that is not his own. Now here's a key point. You remember the high priest had to go into the Holy of Holies once a year, right? To make atonement for the sins of the people, right? Once a year, he carried sacrificial blood into the Holy of Holies on the mercy seat, offered to God on behalf of the people. Guess what? He was carrying something else's blood, an animal. What if God came along and changed the rules? And he said, okay, no longer are we going to kill spotted, uh, unblemished spotless lambs anymore. So here's the deal. Uh, all the high priests are going to have to shed their own blood and they're going to carry their own blood in there and they're going to pour their own blood on the mercy seat for the atonement of the people. I promise you this, the line standing to be high priest would go greatly down. It would diminish that. They would be looking for people to see. But notice what the word of God says here. For then, in verse 26, he would have had to suffer again and again since the foundation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the consummation of the ages to put away sin by his sacrifice. The rules did change. Jesus became the high priest. He didn't carry something or somebody else's blood and sprinkle it in the holy of holies. He shed his own rich, red, royal, innocent blood. The sacrificer became the sacrifice. And he one time, once and forever, offered up his own personal life. You understand that's why Christianity 
is such a personal thing because a personal Savior personally yielded his own life, his own blood for the sins of us all. You see, there was a day. Look at verse uh, uh, that 26 one more time. In verse 26. For then he would have suffered again and again since the foundation of the world, but now he's appeared once for all at the consummation of the ages to put away sin by his sacrifice. There was a day in Christianity when the blood was forcefully preached from its pulpits, but no longer. We've eradicated it out of most of our churches. But let me remind you of something. Sin and its mark on your life is a stain that gain or tide or Clorox will never be able to wash it away. You can't do anything about your sin. You can't cleanse yourself. You can't get so good that God grants you his forgiveness. You are totally incapable of removing sin stain from your own life. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, but when you turn away from sin and you by faith place your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus says, I will cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. I will plunge it into the deepest of the seas and I will never bring it back up against you ever again. And you can be clean in no other way except through Jesus. Verse 27, and just as people are appointed to die once and then to face the judgment, I don't mean to be Debbie Downer here today, really bringing you hope. Because Jesus, God has already circled your death's day on his calendar. The day of your death has already been determined. Now, that doesn't relieve us from the efforts to preserve our life whatsoever. We ought to take care of ourselves. We ought to go to doctors. We ought to take medication. We ought to do all that we can to preserve our life. I have no problem with that, but God knows the appointed day of your death. And the Bible says after that, the judgment. Now, regardless of what Shirley MacLaine propagates, there is going to be no reincarnation. It's over. Verse 28, so also after Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, to those who eagerly await him, he will appear a second time. Not to bear sin, but to bring salvation. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is coming back not to deal with sin again, but to bring salvation to those that the Bible says are eagerly awaiting his return. He's coming back again, not to offer up a second plan to those who rejected him the first time, but he's coming back again to gather up all of us who are waiting for his return. If he were to come today, would he find you eagerly waiting him? If he were to come today, would he find you ready? Would he find you serving? Would he find you purified and cleansed? Or would he find you not waiting? Would he find you unprepared? Well, you can be ready, just like all the rest of us that got ready is realizing we can't do anything about our sin. Can't do anything about its stain on our life. 
The only hope that any of us ever have is to turn away from sin and to place our faith in the finished work of Calvary. Do you remember where you were when you did that? Now you may not remember the day or the date, but you understand salvation is such a cataclysmic, convulsive event that occurs in a person's life that it leaves them changed forever. Now, now listen, if your life's never been changed, I doubt very seriously if you've ever been saved. Because the Bible says old things pass away and all things become new. Have you had a time in your life that your life has been changed? If, it, if you don't, then you need one and it can be today and it can be right here. Let's stand together if you would, every head bowed and every eye closed, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Father God, I just come before you now in your presence and I thank you for who you are. I thank you, Lord, that one day you called me to yourself. Thank you that you granted me the gift of repentance. Thank you that I have a vivid memory of how my life gloriously was converted that day. Never been the same since. Never wanted to go back ever again from that point on. God, that's your work in my heart and my life. And I pray that for everybody that's here this morning. I really sense in my spirit today, God, that you have brought some people here to this service, to this occasion, to hear this message so that no longer will their past haunt them, chase them, accuse them, so that today they could be forgiven. So today they could be set free from the penalty of sin, set free from the power of sin from this moment on. I pray that nobody would leave this auditorium today without Jesus, without salvation, without assurance. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.